Welcome to Hearthside Lore. The Bretonian Army. The Knights of Bretonia are feared and respected throughout the world. Men of valor and honor, they are exceptional warriors and guardians of their land that was founded upon the most heroic of ideals. In the name of the Lady of the Lake and for glory of Duke and King, they sweep aside evil on the field of battle, for none can stand against their glorious charge. The Bretonians are a powerful army, formed around a core of brave knights, supported by scores of low-born peasants. They are a warlike and valiant people, who willingly seek out battle as a way of securing personal honor and pride. Any who invade their domain face the fury of their powerful knights, and few foes can match them on open ground. The knights range from the youngest knights errant, eager to prove their worth, through to the knights of the realm, defenders of the land. Rarer still are the questing knights, wandering warriors engaged in the quest for the grail, and the legendary grail knights themselves, who have succeeded in their quest and sipped from the goddess's grail, becoming imbued with fey power and longevity. Some knights ride to battle borne upon the backs of noble Pegasus, flying high above the army to descend on their foes. When the knights of Bretonia march to war, their men-at-arms march beside them, as do a levy of peasant bowmen drafted into service. The aim of a Bretonian army is to ride down the foe, using their knights to crush all who would dare stand before them. The peasant's role is to support the knights by peppering the foe with arrows and to crew the mighty trebuchets. Regiments of men-at-arms march into battle to protect the flanks of their knightly lords and to lend their weight of numbers to the fight if the knight's charge does not rout the enemy. All while the blessing of the Lady of the Lake protects the knights from harm, surrounding them with a protective mystical shield that wards off blows and deflects arrows and cannonballs alike. A well-constructed and orchestrated Bretonian offensive will often smash straight through the foe, allowing the knights to wheel back around for a second devastating charge. The History of Bretonia, being an account of the rise of the Bretoni and their lord, Gilles le Breton, as scribed by Adelrond of Coron. The Battles of Gilles the Uniter and the Companions. Loyal subject of the king, be it known to you that in the bygone age afore the lady was found, the green-skinned beast did wreck havoc and rampage across Bretonia. In that time of dole and sorrow, many proud tribes of this fair sacred land were hewn and slaughtered as cattle. Score upon score of greenskin armies did ravage and rage, like the thunderstorm, deep into the verdant heart of the land. In the north, the virtue fared little better. Barbarians once more beset great river and coast for to burn, repine, and pillage. The hated, twisted beasts of dark forests harried forth from their darkened groves, and great pyres of Bretoni flesh turned day to night with black char smoke. Death, too, did ride unfettered throughout once fair lands, those that would do his foul works unchecked and possessed of great rage. All did seem lost for the Bretoni, and the land itself did weep and wail in heart grief as all life was choked away. Greatly sought upon was the safety of the castle strongholds, and the sword swains of our fair nation did stand aghast 
as their lands were consumed. But lo, in fair bastone the young Lord Gilles did refuse to concede his land to the dark. Upon a mighty charger he rode out against the foe. Those faithful to his sword and to the lands upon his heel. Many of his proud knights did fall and join the land, but afore the tip of Giel's lance, the canker-devouring bastone was cleansed. Visions spake unto Giel of the multitude of enemies that stood poised to destroy the lands of his peers. And three days hence, Giel did avow to ride forth with his surviving knights, for should the mighty war hosts of the green skinned beast flow into one great tide, the lands of the Bretoni would come unto their doom. And be it known that fate did smile upon Gilles, for at his side rode long time friend and blood brother, Theorulf of Leoness, and famed Landwin, Lord of Musilon and finest night that ever was. The twilight sky bore witness to them as they made their peace in the shade of the forest of Chalon, prepared to give their lives as one in the next day's battle. But lo, on the morn a ghostly vision came unto them, a maiden of surpassing beauty and fey power arising from the mirror-sheened lake beside which they were camped. The knights knew full well that the sublime apparition was no mortal creature, for nary a ripple disturbed the waters. She gifted her bounty and her blessing unto Gilles, enchanting his banner with her likeness. The bodies of the companions became suffused with unearthly strength and light. Their eyes did glow with lambent flame from within and their weapons and armor shone with new power. Thus did Gilles, Landwin, and Thurulf transcend mortal clay and earn sanctity to become the first of the Grail Knights, the famed companions of the Grail. On the morn the enemy arrayed upon the field were like unto a living sea, of such number that all hope seemed forlorn. Yet Gilles and his companions rode forth as vengeful gods of war and parted the tide. Victory after victory was won. A hundred score fell before their terrible wrath. The verdant fields ran crimson and black, and the greenskins, trapped twixt sword and sea, fled howling into the tide to be claimed by the claw of Manan. Few escaped the fury of the blessed knights, and the lands were saved. Gilles unfurled the standard of the lady upon a great mound of the dead, and the people did rejoice. In this deed Gilles had won the first of his famed twelve great battles, and with it the allegiance of Lord Marcus of Bordelot and Lord Fredemund of Aquitaine. That day the first forged bonds of brotherhood that were to unite the Bretoni were the true prize, and Gilles' victory was a beacon of hope in the bleak and dire night, and his companions were an inspiration to soldier and seneschal alike. But whither should they wend? asked Landwin, and Gilles did reply, South. The knights took the coast the seas calming at their passage as they rode through the surf towards embattled Brion. They came upon the rear guard of a great war horde of greenskins, their lords borne aloft on long-necked weavern. Upon their sight Fredemund did sound his clarion horn, and summoned to him a mighty flock of falcons that struck terror into the black hearts of the enemy and tore at the wings of the orc beasts, driving them to the ground. The knights fought deep into the heart of the greenskin horde where Landwin struck down the bloated orc warlord, and Fredman slew his monstrous mount. 
Thus was the second great battle won. And so from that day riding hard, companions five did travel onward to the besieged Castle Brion. Just as they struck the foe garnered about the great moat, Lord Baldwin of Brion sallied forth across his oaken drawbridge with the last of his knights. Baldwin himself took the brutal axe that day stuck fast in his shield, and emblazoned there for evermore. Though their number was outmatched fifteen score to one, the Bretoni tore through the green skins like a scythe through wheat in harvest. And Gilles and Baldwin did hail well met in the midst of the battle. They clasped forearms as brothers, and Baldwin was joined into the number of the companions. Thus was the third great battle won. Afterward, urged ever on by night blessings and visions from the Lady of the Lake, the companions did venture to cross the mighty river Brienne, and spurred their chargers a hundred league through the shattered lowlands of Carcassonne, toward the land of Cunel. Grim Lord Lambard of Carcassonne did spy the banner of the Lady and come unto their side. And as they raced through day and night, the companions clashed swords with green skin borne upon great wolf that did snap hungrily at their steeds. The companions held true, and after several weary nights, the shadow of great Cunel did fall upon them. But rejoice was denied. They were greatly vexed to sight the borders of fair Lauren, a flame though each were bone-weary and in sore need of succor. The divine power of the lady flowed strong, and the companions made haste unto the greenskins that did hew and put to flame the ancient forests. A night of blood and fire came upon them, and the companions fought tirelessly with skill unmatched and awesome majesty. The dark was lit by shining sword, and I ablaze. And the wrath of the goddess was such that her champions could not fall. Bow joined blade as the ancient forest came to the companion's aid, to choke and bind, to smite flesh and break bone. The fey spirits of that haunted forest did flit and glimmer beyond sight amongst the branches, striking down those that dared do harm to their realm. Thus did Gilles become friend to the Fae, and did win his fourth great battle. Granted restful sleep by the lady, the companions greeted the new sun to find themselves refreshed, and their wounded bodies whole and sound once more. Suffused with the vigor of a spring dawn, the companions did ride northward to lend their swords to beleaguered Paravon. Now amongst their number, Radamund the Pure, Lord of Cunel. And so it came that the eight companions did ride upon once handsome Paravon, carved from stark mountainside by the river Grismarie, only to find after seven nights of long travel that it stood in rack and in ruin. Fell giants aloft in the peaks above did heft and rain boulders down upon the city below. Born aloft on his faithful Pegasus Glorfinial Lord Agilgar of Paravon, wheeled through the air above the city, the better to take the battle to the lofty crag and distant eyrie, and he did smite the foe. The goblin of the severed hand did defile the streets and citizens below, setting a great flame and taking fair maidens into slavehood. Through cobbled streets charged the companions, cleansing alley and courtyard, riding down enemy without number beneath iron-shod hoof, and casting twist and lumpen bodies into the flames. Thus was the fifth great battle won. And that day, Agilgar did gladly troth his lands to Gilles, 
and the blossoming coterie of companions galloped on until, as the sun set, they came upon the land Montfort. There they saw the towering Lord Martred and his kin give their all to fend clear a dozen tribes of fierce night goblins, who gushed forth from the mountainside in a number like unto a black and unstoppable flood. Axe bite pass, that dark veil upon which Castle Mufar broods was carpeted in a carrion feast of a thousand dead. The companions rode out into the tide of black-clad fiends, and did lay about themselves mightily until, alas and woe, how great the pity. Gilles was transfixed upon a mighty bolt sent heartward by an infernal device of the cowardly goblin. Weeping, the companions bore their lord in fever dream aloft into the castle. A night of dark grief and desperation came. The companions as unquiet ghosts around Giles' death pallet, as leeches and surgeons were heard to dolefully proclaim that dark night to be his last. It is unmeet that I should write of the depths of the companions' woe. But the lady was within Gilles, and as dawn broke the fallen hero did grasp the shaft of the bolt with a great roar and pull it bodily from his chest where light streamed out. Grim and wrathful, Gilles was like unto a divine sky warrior as he rode forth once more, smiting a three flock of weaverns that descended upon him from the black-bellied skies, one felled by the very bolt that had struck him. A full week was embattled Montfort sieged before the companions turned the tide. The night goblins fell away into their dark caverns and dark chasms to lick at their wounds as dogs in their misery. Thus was the sixth great battle won. But be it known that Gilles would not let the enemy from under his sight and did lead his companions after the retreating foe plunging into the everlasting night of the caves. On and down and on and down they galloped, ever deeper through the labyrinth, their only radiance the flame that licked from blade and blazed in eye. They slew all the trolls and the dark creatures of the depths that came upon them for to bar their way delving ever downward into the dark heart of the mountain, where man was not meant to tread, and they knew no fear. Within those dank and fetid halls the goblin kings were cut down from throne and skewered upon lance like unto hogs. Thus was the seventh great battle won, and Gilles fought a path back toward the light, drenched in the black blood of the foe. Ten strong the Bretonni lords bolstered by Martred of Montfort, then rode north and westward toward Guisero, where they were joined by Beren, master of that troubled land. Once more did they come against foul and frothing greenskins, in this their next great battle. But this time... The evil beasts had called down the eyes of their base gods. These twin and savage spirits sought to smite the companions, but the heavens did shake with their frustration. For, as all know, dark magics cannot harm those under the auspice of the lady. There began a fray, fell and fierce. Lord Baldwin rode before the companions in a fury like unto a berserker of the north, hewing the heads of a dozen shamans with a single sweep of his axe. Tens of thousands numbered the slain that day, yet not a drop of blood fell from the companions in their stride. The green-skinned beasts fled in disarray, for as their conjurations failed, 
their hope was extinguished as a candle in a storm. Thus was the eighth great battle won. On the morn the companions made haste to the west. They entered upon the lands of Musalon, pride of the realm of Landwin. Alas, hope proved false for poor Landwin, for in his absence his land had been turned to smoldering ruin. Cattle lay slaughtered in blackened wasteland, and once pure river was dark with foulness. A bilious stench carried up from swampland where in times past virgin glade stood proud. The companions rode in grim silence through the gates of Musalon for to join with the remnants of Landwin's family and Fulgar, the neighboring lord of Artois. Fulgar had come with dire news of a great host marching under full moon, Upon all sides beset by beast and living dead, the companions fought as chatelaines, one to each wall, there to hold out against the foe. Gilles hewed the head from an immense drake beast's shoulders. Theorulf wrestled with a monstrous two-headed giant, while Agilgar, borne aloft upon his pegasus, joined battle with bat-winged fiends in the lightning-laced clouds above. The companions found triumph when Landwin struck down the foul night creature that had called the dead forth from their peace, and the beastkin fled howling into the darkness of the forest. Thus was the ninth great battle won. Having triumphed, the companions spurred their war horses to the north. Thereafter, many long nights in the shade of the forest of Arden they did come upon the elf landstone of Langeel, city fortress of the coast, and they hoped to find respite, but to no avail. As the grand port was embattled by crude men of the north clad in pelt of fur and steel, and the companions did meet them in a great tempestuous battle, joining the lord of the city, Lord Cordwin. As the battle raged, night upon night, day upon day, the moons turned, and many thousand savages and barbarians were hewn and cast wailing into the sea. But the fierce foe paid no regard. Orgulous and grim, the Northmen would not give, for they sought glory or death in the eye of their bloody gods. In desperation, Lord Marcus of Bordelot did throw down his challenge to the fell Lord of the Norse, the towering giant Svengar of the Scalings. Find victory, or take leave. In his pride, Svengar would not refuse. Many brave warriors had met death under the barbarian's bloody hand, yet fear did not chill Marcus's heart, for he knew that the lady was with him. Then did the warriors meet atop the towering lighthouse of Langeel, ancient and fey in construct, all Bretonia at their feet. Cloud roiled and storm lashed as the combatants fought, the elements themselves conspiring to aid the twin hammers of Svengar. Night bowed to day, and day to night, and still the warriors fought, a concert of steel reaching the ears of all below. Finally, Marcus opened his foe's guard and struck his opponent with a blow of such might he fell in twain to the rocks below. In respect of the warrior skills of the Bretonian lords, the Norse took sail back to their icy homelands. Thus, was the tenth great battle won. The companions rested well that night. On the morn they pressed toward the rising sun under the province of Coron, where they were joined by Lord Carleond. There they faced the amassing armies of orc kind pushing toward Langeel. On the banks of the fast-flowing river Sanez, battle was met and the water did run black that day with foul blood spilled. 
The orcs turned their eyes from the great halo of light playing round the companions and were struck down into the mire as they turned to flee. Never before had such a great toll of greenskins been slain upon a single day, nor ever since. So much tainted blood quenched the dry earth that it seems as marshland underfoot even to this very day. Thus was the eleventh great battle won. Now lend your ear to the twelfth great battle of Gilles, fought upon the great and verdant fields of Corone Plain. To southwest over the river did squat the dark and haunted forest of Arden. From within depths uncharted came lopping all manner of monster and great beast. Giants, trolls, and creatures without name stalked through a press of beastmen, so great that from a vantage they seemed to the companions as swarming insects crossing the ford of Senez. Tribe upon tribe of greenskins descended from the pale sisters to the southeast and blackened the horizon with a horde five thousand score at least. There was so great a noise and tumult, it seemed as if the earth would shake and split asunder. The companions made their prayers and arrayed themselves for this final battle. But disaster played its hand once more, as at their back, the fair city of Coron was overrun by an unnatural tide of vermin. Rats walking as men took notched blade to the guard and erupted. In great number from the gates to threaten the companions from the rear. Surrounded on all sides by a number of foe beyond countenance, the companions yet stood resolute and without fear. For the lords of each of the fourteen lands of the Bretoni now stood as one, the gathering complete, and their brotherhood and bonds of faith stood stronger than steel. They knew in their hearts the lady's power flowed through them that day, and that none could stand against them. Mighty indeed was this last and most epic of battles and each companion performed such deeds as to fill the sagas of wordsmiths and scribes until the end of time. The moons raced across the darkened sky, replaced by the burning orb of the sun, but to no respite. Only the lady knows the number of weeks that saw battle, but against all odds, the companions emerged victorious. The piles of dead were stacked like unto mountains, and searing pyres burnt the slain enemy, such that night was turned to day for a season and more. Thus was the twelfth and final great battle won. In this way, with the sacred lands of the Bretoni scored of evil, and its people made safe. The death of Gilles Le Breton. Alas, years later, death did take his due. Gilles, honored as the Breton and the Uniter, was calamitously struck down. A veritable god of war, that had by his great deeds won peace. Some whispered he had no place, and he sought out a battle wherever it lay. He was slain by a fell weapon loosed by an unknown hand. And to this day the knights of Bretonia forswear the coward's weapon that kills from afar. With his dying breath, he bade to be bared into the nearby lake before his journey to sainthood became complete. There his body was laid reverently upon a ghostly ship that seemed formed from the mists. With lamentations and much mourning, each companion watched through tear-streaked eye as Gilles transcended from this earthly coil 
to an isle of bliss in the other world, there to join the lady herself for all eternity. And yet he is not gone from us, for it is said by prophetess and seer that in our darkest hour, Gilles Le Breton, great uniter and slayer of armies, will come unto us once more from that fey isle. Thus ends the majestic history of Gilles Le Breton. The land of chivalry, the founding of the kingdom. In the long distant past, the lands of the Bretonni were secured by Gilles Le Breton, and the kingdom of Bretonia was formed. Each of the Bretonni lords swore oaths of fealty to Gilles, who they proclaimed as their ruler. The lords themselves were each given the title of duke, and the traditional borders of the lands were formalized, creating the fourteen dukedoms. Gilles became the ruler of all Bretonia, though he also fulfilled the role of Duke of Baston. With the tragic death of Gilles in the year 17, 995 by the imperial calendar, there was much lamentation throughout the lands as all of Bretonia mourned. Gilles' only son Louis, who was born under mysterious circumstances, some say he was the child of the lady herself, became the Duke of Baston. However, the question of whether he should also become ruler of Bretonia was much debated. Many advocated that Landwin of Mousselin should take the position, while others believed that Landwin's rival, Theorolf of Lyonnais, or the wise Marcus of Bordeaux, would make a more suitable ruler. The majority of the dukes eventually agreed that Louis should take the role. But that posed another problem for he had not drunk from the grail of the Lady of the Lake as had all the other dukes. And no knight, it was decreed, no matter his birth, should be able to become Lord of Bretonia without first having the blessing of the goddess. So it was that Louis left court and set out immediately on his quest to find the Lady and prove his worth before her, earning himself the title The Rash, Thus was the tradition of the questing knight born. For years Louis the Rash traveled the length and breadth of Bretonia, righting wrongs and doing great deeds. In his absence, Theorolf of Lyonnais acted as steward of Bretonia, much to the chagrin of Mousselon, so it is said. Years later Louis entered his ancestral castle astride a mighty purebred charger, his golden hair shining and his eyes aglow with noble power. None could doubt that the lady had blessed him, and his subjects fell to their knees before him. So it was that he was crowned as king of Bretonia, and the golden crown of Bretonia, a gift from the lady herself, was placed upon his brow by the fay enchantress, she who had borne away the fatally wounded Gilles, and who was the sacred representative of the Lady of the Lake herself. All of Bretonia rejoiced in their new monarch. His first act as king was to formalize the code of honor that his father and the companions lived by. The original vows of chivalric knighthood still existed within the halls of Bastogne, crumbling parchments decorated with elaborate script that detailed the duties of the knights. All over Bretonia the knights embraced their vows, and many noble warriors gave up their castles to embark on the path of the questing knight. A wave of faith swept Bretonia, and the Lady of the Lake became the primary deity of the nobles. The dukes continued to push back evil from their borders, and Bretonia flourished. The great port cities grew large and sprawling with renewed trade. Grail chapels were built in places of holy significance, and the Fay Enchantress guided the Bretonians in the worship of the Lady. For hundreds of years, Bretonia continued to grow in strength and influence. When their lands were threatened, they crushed their foes. 
for who indeed could hope to best the might of a unified Britonia? Even as the last of the Grail companions passed from this world and were mourned, ever more knights succeeded in their own quest for the Grail, and the otherworldly Grail knights became a great power within the dukedoms. Many great battles were won, and sumptuous victory banquets were common. King Guillaume defeated the orc tribes of the massive Orkel Highlands, sparing none. Lord Lamort smashed the fleets of the undead at Savage Point. The hated beasts of the forest were pushed deeper into the darkened realms, expelled from the open lands by Duke Theodremond of Artois. With Britonia itself strong and secure, the dukes turned their gaze beyond the traditional borders. The Crusades and Wars of Errantry In the year 470, 1448 by the imperial calendar, the southern realm of Astalia was invaded by Jafar, the hated despot of Araby. Diplomatic envoys pleaded with Britonia to send aid, and the king sent out his call to war. Throughout all the dukedoms this call was heard, and countless knights pledged their lands to the cause. In his noble wisdom, King Louis the Righteous gave permission for warriors of the Empire to cross into Britonia on their journey to Astalia, for they too had pledged their aid, despite the lack of honor the Empire had oft displayed. The innumerable armies of Jafar could not stand before the might of Britonia, and thousands fell beneath the charge of the noble knights. Retreating back to Araby, Jafar's armies were hounded by the Bretonians, who pursued them relentlessly. Not even the harsh desert conditions could perturb the knights, and their fervor slowly took its toll on Jafar's warriors. As the wars entered their third year, Jafar's armies began to fracture, for many of the tribes grew wary of the despot's tyranny. After frustrating months of minor skirmishes, the Bretonians faced Jafar at the Battle of El Haik. Elemental spirits of the deep desert were summoned to fight along Jafar's armies yet. Despite being vastly outnumbered, a great victory was won by the Bretonians, and the despot's forces scattered. Disliking the harsh, dry land for it proved too vast and hostile to be properly conquered, the Bretonians sailed back home, their cargo holds filled with exotic treasure and spoils. Meanwhile, a second great crusading army led by Baron Tybalt had left Bretonia and was traveling the long road overland towards Araby. Hearing of the great victory, this force did not press on to the desert lands, though many of the knights smarted not to have shared in the glory and a great many of them wished to enter the lands of the hated desert kings. Nevertheless, under Tybalt's leadership they pushed into hands that had not yet been conquered by any civilized race. Seeking glory and honor, they sought out the armies of greenskins that plagued these lands, and many great victories followed. The hardy dwarves that dwelled in the mountains around these lands rejoiced, for the Bretonians had dealt a serious blow to their ancient enemies, the Orcs, and they bestowed much praise and honor upon the knights. Rare it was these days for the reclusive dwarves to have contact with the world outside their mountain holds, yet this victory ensured that a bond was formed between these two civilizations. These lands later became known as the Border Princes, Indeed, some knights remained there, building great castles in the following decades. Despite these grand crusades beyond Bretonia, the dukedoms themselves were not left undefended, for there were still intermittent threats within the borders. One such threat coincided with the deadly red pox that swept through the southern dukedoms, decimating the populations of peasants in the stinking slums and hovel villages. As if this were a trigger, foul creatures erupted from their hidden lairs, 
mutated vermin that walked like men and held rusting weapons in their clawed hands. Marching to the aid of the Duke of Paravon came the mysterious fey folk of Athel Lauren, lending their otherworldly powers to the knights to destroy this threat before disappearing once more. Other perils have all been successfully decimated including other attacks from other hated minions of chaos, be they berserk Norsemen or foul forest beasts. Throughout the ages, other crusades have been waged by the proud Bretonians, though none so great. One such crusade was led into the deep deserts to the east of Araby, and a great many battles were fought against the hated undead kings of the land. Others have seen Bretonians fighting far from home, even as far across the oceans as the jungle lands of the New World. Some of these crusades were declared as errantry wars, a tradition that derives from the old custom of the errand of knighthood. Usually young knights would be set a task by their lord, an errand that they must fulfill before they can attain full knighthood. Errands traditionally included such things as the recovery of a lost artifact, the slaying of a beast terrorizing a rural village, or successfully escorting a noble lady through dangerous lands. However, in times of war and peril, a king may declare an errantry war. At such time, a young knight errant may earn the title of Knight of the Realm through brave deeds and daring exploits on the field of battle. When an errantry war is declared, young knights from all over Britonia rally to the cause, eager to earn their full knighthood. The unseasoned knights throw themselves into battle recklessly and with great enthusiasm, each trying to outdo the others and gain the attention of their betters. As such, the king may declare an errantry war when he has a need to quickly gather a large, well-motivated army. In the year 1223, 2201 by the imperial calendar, King Lewin Orkslayer amassed a grand army after declaring an errantry war, with thousands of young knights joining the ranks of the more experienced retinues of the dukes. Together, this army smashed the growing orc and goblin forces that had been amassing for many years on the borders of Bretonia. The traditional frontiers of the dukedoms were expanded, and many green-skinned strongholds which had remained in isolated areas along the borders were finally conquered. New castles were built along these borders, and many of the young knights errant were granted these domains along with full knightly title at the end of the years of war. The longest errantry war ever fought was launched by King Charlotte in 1442, 2420 by the imperial calendar. The border princes were overrun by enemies, and despite their bitter resistance they were being worn down. Charlin responded instantly to their appeal for aid, declaring his intention to rid the old world of all greenskin menace once and for all. Charlin was a brave and mighty warrior, but was never known for his great powers of wit or learning, for scholars knew that the greenskin hordes could never truly be eradicated. Nevertheless, countless thousands of young knights embraced Charlin's vision passionately, and a great army set off across the mountains. However, a great many knights perished on this arduous journey. At first, victory followed victory, and the orcs were slaughtered on the banks of Blood River. Nevertheless, as the years rolled by and more young knights traveled to the region to gain honor, Britonia grew weaker due to the lack of defenders within its borders. For over sixty years, the wars continued, draining Britonia of entire generations of knights. Eventually, under King Philip V, the errantry war was ended after a tragic defeat at Dread Pass. The Britonians, in their pride, do not cope well with defeat 
and were it not for the wise king ending the wars, then countless more knights may have thrown their lives away in an effort to regain the honor of their defeated brethren. The dead walk the lands. The dead rising from their graves is a common theme amongst the tropes of traveling players that journey around Britonia, reflecting the profound effect that the undead have had on the nation. A very superstitious people, the idea of the dead walking is especially horrific and aberrant to the Bretonians, both noble and commoner alike. Peasants will often bury their loved ones face down in the earth, with dried crow's feet in their mouths and cloves of garlic in their ears, apparently to stop them from rising from their graves. In times long past, legions of dead warriors borne upon the seas in fleets of shallow-bottomed boats raided the coastline, and rumors of these fleets still persist. In isolated hamlets across Bretonia, there are said to be foul vampiric warrior knights, the most famous of these being the so-called Red Duke, who plagues the lands of Aquitaine. Many a questing knight has set out to rid the lands of these horrors, and never returned. The cursed realm of Musalon has long been associated with the dead. Indeed, it is a very morbid realm for death and disaster feature strongly in its history. Being built on a sinking swampland and subject to frequent flooding, the tombs of the dead in Musalon are built above ground. So large are the sprawling macabre graveyards that they are likened to towns in their own right. It is said that all manner of foul necromantic sorcerers lurk amid the darkened crypts. One of the more recent major battles fought against the undead took place at La Massontale Abbey in the Grey Mountains. An undead horde, led by the dread lichmaster Heinrich Kemmler and a dead warrior of chaos, Krell, attacked this sacred place. The lichmaster is a hated figure in Bretonian lore and mothers use stories of his deeds to scare their children into behaving. The battle was only won thanks to the skill and heroism of Duke Tancred of Cunel and his knights, even though they were also assailed by a swarm of foul, chaotic vermin. The knights returned to their lands with much honor, for their victory was truly valorous. Nevertheless, the Lichmaster escaped from the battle, and Tancred spent the remainder of his life pursuing the hated necromancer. Tragically, Tancred himself fell in battle with the forces of the Lichmaster at the Battle of Montfort Bridge, though he did succeed in smashing Kemmler's force. It is said that the Lichmaster is biding his time to exact his revenge against Bretonia. The Land of Despair Musalon is a cursed realm, a crumbling city surrounded by stinking swamps and marshes, a land that is shunned by the rest of Bretonia. It is said that in that doom-laden land the dead walk the dark and empty streets, that all manner of unnamed horrors lurk in the depths below the castles and that the night is filled with screams and laughter from beings no longer of this earth. Those dwelling there are the most desperate of people, for none would choose to live in this tragic land other than the evil-hearted and the outcast. Dispossessed and dishonored knights band together here, as do hordes of the most malformed and diseased peasants. Those who remain of the cursed bloodline of Musalon rule this land with absolute authority. These remnants of the decadent and corrupt nobility wear pitch-black armor and never raise their visors, or so it is said, in fireside tales. However, for a period in history, Musalon threw off its dark reputation. This was during the time of Gilles Le Breton, and his grail companions. 
for the bravest, most skilled, and honorable companion of all was Landwin, the favored son of Musalon, and their first duke. He was the epitome of knighthood, the paragon that all knights aspired towards, and he was beloved by all. None could stand before his wrath, and Musalon gained much honor thanks to his mighty deeds. Tragically, with the death of Gilles, Landwin fell into a terrible malaise from which he never truly recovered. The land of Musalon itself felt his pain and began to fall into ruin and despair, continuing to do so even after his death. Thus did Musalon begin to fall back towards being a realm shunned by the other Bretonian dukedoms. It has since fallen further into darkness. Many believe that the land itself is cursed. It is certainly true that vermin seem to thrive in this fetid land, though many dwelling within its borders suffer madness, and many other unnatural things occur on an almost daily basis. Two key moments in history can be isolated that have irredeemably doomed this haunted land in the eyes of other dukedoms. The first of these occurred during the outbreak of the terrible Red Pox in the early years of the 9th century. After the formation of Bretonnia, the Duke of Musulam Merovec was a proud warrior who was desperate for his realm to regain the prestige and honor that it had during the reign of Landwin. Led astray by his corrupted advisors, but with only honorable intentions, Merovec began dabbling in things far beyond his power or control. When the Red Pox struck Bretonnia in 835, 813 by the imperial calendar, Merovec and his knights were strangely unaffected, as foul rat creatures appeared in their thousands to kill and maim. Merovec saw that his time to shine had come. Riding south with his black-armored knights, he slew thousands of the chaotic creatures and broke the siege of Brion. The route his army took mirrored the road taken by Gilles' grail companions before him. As he then pushed towards the east, crossing Carcassonne, his dreams were filled with blood, death, and honor. In his delusions... He actually believed that he was Landwin reborn, and that he was the only one who could save Bretonnia. Meeting up with the armies of Paravon and the Fey folk of Athel Loren, a great victory was won, and the rat creatures scattered before the martial might of Merovec and his most trusted knights. In the middle of the battle, Merovec was soaked in blood, reveling in the killing. Even after his foe lay unmoving, still he continued to hack at them with his gore-soaked blade. The virtuous and honorable knights of Paravon looked on in horror. Merovec invited the dukes to his castle for a great victory feast. Many saw him as a savior, for he had saved Brion and Cunel. Nevertheless, the banquet horrified the chivalrous dukes. Dinner was served by shambling servants, and the dukes were shocked to see spitted and impaled criminals arrayed about the hall. Merovec could not understand their discomfort at all, and having already drained many goblets of fine Bordeaux wine, he drunkenly claimed that his hospitality was being dishonored. The king was repulsed by Merovec, and spoke against him and his court. In a rage, Merovec accused the king of jealousy and plotting against Musulon. The king formally challenged Merovec, though the other dukes begged to be the one allowed to punish the disgraceful knight. In the ensuing combat, Merovec fought like a demon and tore out the king's throat with his bare hands. Merovec raised his goblet and filled it with blood of the king which he then drank from. The other dukes hastily left Musulon to gather their armies, pursued by twisted creatures and malformed peasants. 
In the following months, Merovec was publicly denounced by the Fey Enchantress and the newly crowned king. Lyonnaise led a massive invasion of Mousselon, and many of the knights of Mousselon gladly took up arms against their liege lord, having no wish to be associated with their corrupted duke, and swore fealty to Lyonnaise. Faced with the might of all Bretonia, Merovec was finally slain, though many brave warriors fell beneath his blade. The righteous anger of the Bretonians against one they see as having tainted their own honor is truly to be feared. Later, Mousselon fell even further during the affair of the False Grail, a terrible time when Duke Maldred of Mousselon perpetrated the vilest of crimes. He conspired through treachery to become king, imprisoned the Fey Enchantress, and falsely claimed to have recovered the grail, though this was later proved another of his subtle lies created to gain power. His actions doomed himself, and finally condemned the homeland utterly, and he eventually died after a prolonged siege. From that moment forth, Mousselon was to have no duke by order of the king, and so the position remains unfilled. In recent years, however, there have been stories of a new claimant, a self-appointed duke. It is said that King Lewin may soon embark upon another war to cleanse Mousselon of its growing taint. The Bretonians as a whole look forward to the day when Mousselon is finally raised, burnt to the ground, and forgotten by history. The Rise of a New King The current king of Bretonia is Lewin Lyoncourt, and in him the populace of Bretonia can see echoes of the great warriors of the past. It is said that the blood of Gilles Le Breton runs in him, and his knights give thanks to the lady that they might serve under him, for his nobility and strength harkens back to those times of the Grail Companions, the highest pinnacle of Bretonian heroism. Lewin has revived many of the old warrior traditions, including hosting great tournaments. Indeed, he will often take part in these himself, and has proven time and time again that he is one of the most skilled, fierce, and honorable knights in the land encouraging his knights to hone their martial skills at every opportunity. Some have speculated that Bretonia is currently as powerful as ever it was, perhaps even more so. The king is wise, and he sees that enemies abound. It is the belief of those closest to him that he is readying for a new errantry war. Some believe this could be against Mousselon, while others suggest that it may be launched against the dire forces of evil in the far north. Whatever the case, Bretonia and its knights are ready. A Tale of Years A series of dates given in the imperial calendar, starting with dates before the coronation of Sigmar Heldenhammer, or B.C., before coronation. 1500 BC. It is said that the elves forsook the old world, and the insular dwarves retreated further into their mountain strongholds. The land becomes overrun by all manner of evil natured creatures. 1000 BC. The chiefs of the Bretoni people, proud and warlike horsemen, travel over the grey mountains. Hundreds of years of constant warfare follow as they settle into these fair lands and attempt to drive out the Greenskins. 700 BC The Bretoni lands become dominated by around 20 main horsemen tribes. Smaller tribes are amalgamated into those, or are destroyed. 650 BC Attempts to penetrate the forest of Lorin leave only a handful of survivors driven mad by the Fey terrors. 
and the forest enters Bretonian folklore as being a haunted, magical place. 500 BC The Bretoni tribes continue to fight amongst themselves for control of the land, and the borders of each lord's realm constantly shifts. Nevertheless, the tribes commonly ally to fight against the orcs and goblins. Many of the lords of the Bretoni build great strongholds in their lands. 15 BC In this year, the foreign hero Sigmar fought against the orcs and goblins and broke their power in the lands to the east. 100 History relates that fleets of undead came and did evil in the lands of the Bretoni. 577 Greenskin raids increase, and many settlements are burnt to the ground. Retaliatory raids against the orcs slay thousands. However, several powerful Bretoni tribes fall, and their lands are claimed by rivals. 770 the land of the Bretoni is divided into sixteen areas, and each controlled by one of the major tribes. These have since remained relatively stable, although two lands, Glanboreal and Kulu, are later destroyed. 930. The land of Kulu lying between Brion and Cunel is overrun by a massive orc invasion led by the warlord Gragabad. The horsemen of Kulu ride forth in one final tragic battle, where their line ends. Cunel and Brion ride forth and scatter the greenskin hordes. The two lords meet each other in single combat to decide who will take the land. The Lord of Brion is cut down, and Cunel expands. 932. Baldwin, Lord of Brion, leads his horsemen to victory against the orcs. 947. The northern lands are overrun by greenskin tribes, as well as beastmen that pour forth from the forest of Arden. Around this time, the Norse begin to raid the northern coastal regions and the northern Bretoni tribes are isolated from each other and their lands ravaged. 950. Rosalind of Bastogne weds Theodorulf, lord of Lyonnais. Her brother Gilles and her husband become strong friends, and the ties between the two realms grow strong. 952. Gilles of Bastogne becomes famed throughout the lands of the Bretoni as the young warrior seeks out and slays the giant red worm, Smergus. 974. Orc hordes in numbers never before seen begin to attack the lands of the Bretoni. The land of Glanboreal is utterly destroyed and subsequently amalgamated into Carcassonne. Driving northwards, the Greenskins threaten to overrun Cunel, Brion, and Aquitaine, and thus link up with other orc armies driving into the lands of Paravan, Montfort, Bastogne, and Bordelot. 975. The orc armies attacking Bastogne are repelled, though the Lord of Bastogne is slain. The new Lord of Bastogne, Gilles, leads his horsemen against the foe, joined by his loyal friend Theorolf and the famed Lord Landwin of Musselon. Both Lyonnais and Musselon are under intense pressure from green-skin armies, and they hope to join with Gilles for one final great battle. 976. Gilles is visited by a vision of the Lady of the Lake, who blesses him and his comrades. Thus Gilles, Landwin, and Theorulf become the first Grail Knights. 977. The famous battles of Gilles the Uniter, the Lord of Battles, as he and his companions ride to save their land. They are victorious in each, and earn much honor, glory, and renown. The deeds of the companions become the epitome of aspiration for all knights, and these battles form the basis of countless Bretonian tales in later years. 979. The Forming of Bretonia. 
the lands of the Bertoni tribes are finally secured. A great meeting takes place in the home of Fulgar of Artois. Here the formal dukedoms are created, and the Bretonian calendar is introduced. Each of the great lords of the Bretoni, the fourteen grail companions including Gilles Le Breton, are named dukes. The dukes swear oaths of allegiance, and Bretonia is formed. Fredamond, Duke of Aquitaine, the so-called bird of prey, weds Gilles' youngest sister, Annabelle. 995. Gilles Le Breton is struck down by a hurled weapon while engaged in a challenge against one of the remaining orc warlords of the Grey Mountains, near the edge of the forest of Loren. As he passes from the world, he has a final vision of the lady, and his men carry him to a nearby lake. There he is placed on a ship and sails into the mists to do the lady's bidding for all eternity. It is said that he will return in Bretonia's most dire time of need. 996 With Gilles' unexpected death, it is finally agreed that his son Louis should become ruler. He immediately sets off to search the lands for a sign of the lady, and thus earn her recognition, earning him his title as Louis the Rash. 1001 after many great deeds, Louis gains the lady's blessing. Louis the Rash is crowned with the crown of Bretonia by the Fay Enchantress, and thus becomes king. He draws up the basis of the decrees of chivalry, cementing the strict codes of personal conduct that the companions lived by. 1003. Always competitive. Landwin and Theorulf have a major falling out, with some believing that the cause was over Theorulf's wife Rosalind. A challenge is fought between them, with Landwin coming out victorious, inflicting a wound across Theorulf's face. 1024. Agogar of Paravant is slain. His pegasus Glorfinial is killed by a pair of weaverns above the Grey Mountains and the Duke of Paravant falls to his death. 1045. Bretonia mourns, for Landwin of Mousselin, finest of the companions, is found dead in his bed. 1142. King Guillon defeats a horde of orcs at the Battle of Amandur and pursues them out of Bretonia, sparing none. Theorulf of Lyonesse, the last of the Grail companions whose life was extended by the lady, finally falls in battle. Admiral Henry Lamort of Langille meets the fleets of the tomb king Amenemedum the Great, sent northwards by Setra at Savage Point. The undead fleets are repelled. 1245. The dragon Mergast is slain by King Badwin. 1275. Lamort Grail Chapel is pillaged, and the interred body of Henri Lamort is stolen. 1325. Tournament of La Demoiselle d'Artois. One hundred knights joust for her hand in marriage. 1336. Duke Melman of Cunel disappears on the night of the spring equinox. Stories say he was caught up in the ghostly great hunt that is said to roam the skies on certain nights. Others say he wandered into the forest of Loren, drawn by fey lights. An army of knights is dispatched to assist the Estalians against the hordes of Sultan Jafar of Araby. The despot is hurled back into his own lands with great slaughter. 1451. The Battle of El Haik in which Sultan Jafar of Araby is finally overthrown. 1452. In this year, a mighty host of knights errant goes forth to Araby. They meet orc and goblin tribes at the crossing of the Blood River. Some stay and build castles to hold back the accursed orcs. 1454. 
A foul, vampiric creature calling itself the Red Duke terrorizes the lands of Aquitaine. It is defeated at the Battle of Serein, pierced by the king's own lance. 1578. The Tournament of Guyen, in which King Jules jousts with one of the Fey folk of Athel Loren and is victorious. 1593. Smell the Gauntlet, a game popular with the peasant children of Brion, goes awry and instigates a revolt amongst the lower classes. It is crushed mercilessly. 1635. The Battle of Cassillet. Raiders from beyond the sea attack Langille and are justly slaughtered by King Philippe the Strong and an army of ten thousand knights. 1681. On one eve, the dead rise from their graves and terrorize the lands. It is said that this occurred all across the old world due to an ancient evil reawakening in the south. 1715. In this year, fugitives of the accursed orc horde of the defeated warlord Gorbag invade Britonia. Britonia's courageous knights slay them all. 1813. The red pox ravages Britonia, and wretched Skaven issue forth from their lairs to lay siege to Brion and Cunel. Duke Merovec of Mousselon and his knights are unaffected by the pox, and ride forth to combat the Skaven. He meets up with the Duke of Paravon and the Fey folk of Atha Loren, and together they crush their rat foe. 1814. Duke Merovec of Mousselon holds a great victory banquet. His insanity becomes publicly known, and the blood of the king is spilt in his halls. Mousselon is disgraced, and Lyonnais leads a force against them. Merovec is slain, and Mousselon loses much of its land to Lyonnais. The so-called Red Duke rises from his grave and threatens Aquitaine once more. In this battle, the Duke of Aquitaine is slain. 1932. The so-called Red Duke rises from his grave and threatens Aquitaine once more. In this battle, the Duke of Aquitaine is slain. Nevertheless, the Bretonian knights are victorious and the Red Duke flees into the forest of Chalon. There he is pursued by generations of questing knights, but none know if he resides there still. 2007. The Battle of Coron. Repense de Lyonnais leads her knights to victory against the vilest horde of chaos ever to invade Britonia. 2201. King Lewin Orkslayer declares an errantry war to rid Bretonia of orcs. Countless of these creatures are put to the sword, and their blood stains the earth. 2297. The affair of the False Grail in which Duke Maldred of Mousselon and his sorceress consort are dishonored. Mousselon is formally disgraced, and no duke has since been appointed to govern this dukedom. 2300. In this year, nearly all the people of Mousselon perish of the Red Pox. Duke Maldred and his lady shut themselves within their palace, but to no avail. 2320. The cursed Skaven make raids upon the western ports. The king orders the duke's fleets to be strengthened, and he grants them monies to aid the construction of better ships. 2336. A man emerges from the forest of Loren claiming to be the Duke Melman of Cunel. Within hours he ages dramatically and dies within the day. 2420. Divinely inspired by the Lady of the Lake to rid the entire world of all greenskins, King Charlon renews the errantry wars. A host of knights go forth to assist the border princes and slaughter countless orcs beside the Blood River. 2422. 
Retaliatory attacks from orc tribes ravage Carcassonne. While many of the knights of Bretonia are away fighting to the south, the impoverished land suffers frequent attacks. Many hovels are burnt, and the populace suffers greatly. 2488. A mighty host of knights ride forth into Death Pass and do not return. The king declares the errantry wars at an end. 2491. In this year, undead led by the fell necromancer Heinrich Kemmler, allied with Vile Skaven, sack the Abbey of La Maisontale. They are repelled by Tancred, Duke of Cunel, and his knights. 2500. Lewin Leoncourt is crowned king of all Bretonnia. 2512. The spring festival of Bordelot is disrupted when four peasants dressed as a dragon accidentally slay the peasant playing the Grail Knight. This quickly descends into a town-wide riot as the peasantry run amok, some say addled by wine supplied by Duke Albrecht. This lends weight to the Bretonian phrase, as rare as the sober man of Bordelot. 2515 a peasant named Hubald is knighted after saving the Lady Ariadne from the beasts of the forest, only the third peasant-born ever to have obtained knighthood. He does not survive his first battle. 2517. Rumors speak of an army gathering within Mousselon, led by a mysterious knight. 2519. The bearer of the standard of Bretonnia, Armand, becomes the Duke of Aquitaine at the King's order. 2521. Norse longships begin to raid the north coast of Bretonnia, sacking isolated villages within the dukedoms of Langille and Coronne. 2522. The King readies his armies, and many believe a new errantry war is about to be launched. Vows of Bretonnia. The social order of Bretonnia is determined by a series of creeds and tenets laid down hundreds of years ago in the time of Gilles the Uniter, and formally recorded by his son Louis. Each stratum of Bretonian society rigidly adheres to their particular code. However, due to the antiquity of the original documents, much can be misconstrued by the opportunistic or the foolish. The lower orders of Bretonian society, very few of whom are literate, will gather on the first day of each month to have their credo read to them by a squire or chamberlain. The peasants of Bretonia live hand to mouth, toiling in the fields day in, day out in absolute destitute poverty. Most will not survive to see middle age, and theirs is a thankless role. Yet without their produce and taxes, the knights could ill afford to live in the manner to which they are accustomed. The knights themselves are given to copying out their vows in painstaking illuminated scripts that they treat with reverential care. The knights recite these vows before an image or token of the lady, which depending on the knight's status, can range from a candlelit sketch to a gilded triptych. To break any aspect of their vow is the worst crime imaginable to these noble warriors. No knight would willingly bring dishonor on his name, but should he be forced to betray his creed by foul circumstance, he will often immediately take up the questing vow. The ascendance from one rank of knighthood to another is of the utmost importance to the knights of Bretonnia. As such, no grail knight would willingly be led by a mere questing knight, or, lady forbid, a knight of the realm. Exceptions are rare, and in other matters a knight will generally bow to one of a more senior order. The Peasant's Duty Thou shalt give unto thine glorious liege the taxes that he requires. Thou shalt labor all but feast days. And no more than a tenth share shall you keep for kith and kin. Rejoice, 
for a knight of Bretonia, provides your shield. The Grail Vow. That which is sacrosanct, I shall preserve. That which is sublime, I will protect. That which threatens, I will destroy. For my holy wrath will know no bounds. The Questing Vow. I set down my lance, symbol of duty. I spurn those whom I love. I relinquish all and take up the tools of my quest. No obstacle will stand before me. No plea for help shall find me wanting. No moon will look upon me twice lest I be judged idle. I give my body, heart, and soul to the lady whom I seek. The Knight's Vow When the clarion call is sounded, I will ride out and fight in the name of liege and lady. Whilst I draw breath, the lands bequeathed unto me will remain untainted by evil. Honor is all. Chivalry is all. The Blessing of the Lady since ancient times, the Bretonians have worshipped the Lady of the Lake as their goddess, a figure of myth and legend who guides their kings and protects their land from harm. Worship of the Lady can be traced to the earliest days of the kingdom. It is said that she arose from a lake before Gilles Le Breton and his knightly companions on the dawn of the great victory of Bordeaux. Wreathed in a fey light, the lady rose from the water bearing a grail which overflowed with light that spilled into the waters of the lake, blessing the assembled knights until dawn's light broke over the mountains. Gilles famously dipped his bloodied and tattered banner into the radiant waters of the lake, crying, Lady, bless my banner, only to lift it from the waters magically restored, and bearing the image of the lady and her glittering grail. Gilles and his knights rode out and defeated the orcs, then returned to the lake after the battle to give thanks to the lady for her blessing. And at this lake, he and his companions swore great oaths to serve the lady, and remained together to free the land of Bretonia from the monsters that assailed it. In the years that followed, Gilles and his knights went on to win many great victories. And since those days, worship of the Lady has spread throughout Bretonia. The Lady herself is very rarely seen, and only in the most verdant depths of the land may she be found by a few privileged and pure souls. Those who do find her are regarded as highly favored and are themselves revered. Appearing as an ageless maiden of unearthly beauty, the lady will only appear to those who have faced great peril and are pure of heart. Many knights wishing to prove their valor declare that they will go on a grail quest and seek the Lady of the Lake to sup from her sacred chalice and become one of the legendary grail knights, warriors of unsurpassed skill who are incapable of malice and impure thought. Sacred groves and areas of mystical power are her dwelling places, and the Grail Knights are her protectors, devoting themselves to upholding her honor. No base creatures or evildoers can profane her sacred places, and this is a duty that every knight in Bretonia, not just the Grail Knights, takes very seriously indeed. The Bretonian code of chivalry is inextricably linked with the Lady of the Lake, as it is she who rewards honor and virtue, and the supreme sign of a knight's favor is to receive her blessing. Throughout Bretonia there are many grail chapels built upon sites where the Lady is said to have been encountered ranging from humble roadside shrines to great cathedrals incorporated into a knight's castle. It is the sacred duty of the Grail Knights to protect these shrines, 
and often such knights will devote the remainder of their lives to defending the Lady's Shrine from defilement. These knights are known as Hermit Knights, and spend their lives defending the shrine and the relics housed within. The Muster of Bretonia Heroes of Bretonia Bretonian folklore is replete with the mighty feats of famous knights as they battle against the odds to defeat their evil foes and win the day. In these stories and poems, noble knights seek out and slay ferocious dragons that terrorize the realms, battle and defeat evil warriors, and destroy entire armies of green skins single-handed. No stories are more impressive than those told of Gilles Le Breton and his grail companions, tales that every noble son learns from a young age. It is a common sight to see such youngsters romping around their father's castles, playing out the roles of Gilles and the Grail companions as they take on and defeat the foul enemies besetting the lands. Weaned from a young age on these stories of individual heroism and bravery, it is every knight's utmost desire to have great deeds of their own to be sung and recounted for years after their deaths. A knight's honor is of utmost importance to him, and he would gladly lay down his life rather than have his name disgraced. Despite the exceedingly high standards the knights set for themselves, there are mighty individuals who live up to these goals and become legend. They are the heroes who have performed great deeds on the battlefield and defeated particularly dangerous foes. Their reputation precedes them, and their names and heraldry are known throughout all the dukedoms. Whenever one of these mighty heroes enters a town, his presence will be known within minutes, news of his arrival spreading through the crowded streets like wildfire amongst the commoners, who will flock to get a glimpse of the heroic individual. Many of these mighty heroes are grail knights, having drunk from the grail and become the epitome of chivalric knighthood. However, there are many other legendary individuals who have never attained the station of grail knight, but are in no way lesser heroes for that. Sometimes the responsibilities of governing may hold a knight back from embarking on his quest, though this would surely cause him much pain. The dukes themselves are all-powerful and renowned warriors, for they could not retain their station were they not. Birth, in itself, does not guarantee success, and the sons of the dukes must earn their honor and renown as any other knight. Indeed, a knight of any echelon of birth, though obviously never a peasant, can attain heroic status through great deeds and acts of bravery, rising rapidly through the ranks. In battle, it is these mighty heroes who lead the knights from the front, inspiring leaders that take the fight to the enemy. Many of them follow one of the paths of virtue, the fighting styles and traits of the Grail companions, and they are both masterful warriors and noble leaders. They can sustain wounds that would slay a lesser man and kill many foes with one sweep of a sword or thrust of a lance. Indeed, the heroes of Bretonia will truly live on forever, for tales of their great deeds will be recounted long after they have passed from this world. Devoted of the Goddess Sometimes young children within Bretonia are seen to have strange and mystical powers. They might be born with eyes of different colors, Milk may sour in their presence, where they may be able to predict events before they occur. Other children claim to see ghostly apparitions walking about, or are heard talking to beings that others cannot see. A superstitious people as a whole, whether noble or low-born, the Bretonians will generally be fearful of such gifted children, and go out of their way to avoid them whenever possible. 
invoking the protection of the Lady of the Lake and Shalia. Often, especially within Cunel, such children are perceived as having been touched by the fey inhabitants of the forest, or even replaced with a changeling. However, for every child who shows signs of such mystical powers, there are other gifted children that never display any outward sign of their strange, otherworldly talents. Some of these children are sent to the Empire, if they come from particularly wealthy families, to learn the arts of magic. But this is a rare occurrence. Before they reach puberty, almost all children with these strange talents will be visited by the Fae Enchantress. She takes them with her to the other world, and they are mourned by their parents as if they were no longer living. Nevertheless, it is a great honor to be taken by the Enchantress, and it is believed that they go on to a better place, where their powers are used to serve the Blessed Lady of the Lake herself. While nothing is ever seen of the boy children again, sometimes the girl children will return to Britonia years later as damsels and prophetesses. Damsels and prophetesses are powerful individuals, for in their years away from Britonia their innate abilities have been honed and tempered. Their magic is more oriented around nature than that of most other human wizards for they are taught by the handmaidens of the lady. Riding into battle, the damsels and prophetesses use their powers to lend protection to the noble warriors of Britonia, warding away the foul magic of their enemies as well as casting down the foe with their own powerful spells. They are able to mystically encourage the landscape to fight the enemies of Britonia and the trees themselves lash at their foe. Flocks of birds descend on the enemy at their call, and some can even draw lightning from the heavens to strike down in devastating arcs. When not in battle, they fulfill such roles as advisors to the dukes and king, where their magical abilities and visions may aid their lord. They use their powers to scry into the future, to protect the sacred glades favored by the lady, to detect the truth in the hearts of men, and to lend the lady's healing where needed. As priestesses of the lady, they also maintain her shrines and lead devotions and prayers, in a similar way to the enchantress herself. These powerful individuals exist somewhat outside the usual hierarchy of Britonia and may come and go throughout the realms as they please, for none would dare to cross one so favored by the lady herself. Knights Errant All noble sons of the realm are committed to the path of knighthood from the moment they are born. Though birth into nobility guarantees his place within the circles of knighthood, a young noble is not honored until he has proven his worth. Some earn status through faithful service to their lords, others through powerful connections and family ties. But the most glorious and only true way for a young knight to fulfill his calling is to test himself against the foe on the field of battle. Knights errant project an air of bravado, dealing with peasants and fellow knights alike with a brash self-confidence and a haughty manner, eager to prove their skill and thus attain status and renown. These young nobles are bold and enthusiastic to the point of recklessness, a trait that the common folk idolize and admire. When a duke begins to marshal support for a crusade, Knights errant flock to his banner, vying with one another for martial glory. On the battlefield they are impetuous, eager to earn fame and honor in the thick of the fight. They charge boldly into the fray, heedless of danger, and earning either great honor or a glorious death. The older, more experienced knights rarely discourage them. Some see it as a way of pruning the ranks. Others, 
as a suitable outlet for the enthusiasm of youth. But none would deny a young knight his destiny. Those whose skill and bravery are proven will go on to become knights of the realm. Knights of the realm. Once a knight errant has proved himself worthy of his station, he is confirmed as a knight of the realm. Knights of the realm make up the bulk of the nobility of Britonia and command great respect both for their station and for the deeds they have performed to reach it. Upon his investiture, the knight is given the responsibility of administering a domain, generally a few acres of land, a village, and a castle. As the common folk in the domain are bound to the service of the knight to work his land and pay their taxes, so too does the knight swear fealty to higher orders of nobility. A knight of the realm is duty-bound to defend his people and his land until death. As a noble trained in the arts of battle, a knight is expected to defend himself and his domain against minor threats without assistance from others. If the situation is more desperate, the knight may either marshal the peasants of the village to fight with him, or instead shelter the commoners in his castle until help arrives from neighboring domains. Above all, a knight is required to maintain the standards of knightly honor, obeying the strict tenets of Bretonian chivalry. Amongst the most important of these is to respond to the call to war, when he will fight alongside other knights, not as a rite of passage as he did as a knight errant, but as duty required by his station. For a knight there is no greater shame than to fail in these responsibilities, thus betraying the chivalric code. If he does so, he may be stripped of all titles and rights and be banished from the realm until he can prove himself once more. Questing Knights Since the days of Giel the Uniter, the Grail has been the ultimate symbol of Bretonian chivalry and the ultimate goal of any true knight. A knight who begins at the quest for the Grail relinquishes all his worldly possessions and all ties to his domain. Setting aside his lance, he instates another knight to fulfill his duties of administration and protection prior to setting out upon the quest. The following months and years of the knight's life are filled with trials and hardships that strengthen his mind, body, and soul. The path of a questing knight is a winding one, for they are pledged to never sleep two nights in the same place and never to yield in their search while they yet draw breath. Questing knights live a solitary existence, the Lady of the Lake their only companion. Driven by visions of the Lady and the Grail, a knight may travel for countless leagues. The quest for the Grail knows no physical boundaries, and it is common for a questing knight to travel far beyond his domain and often beyond the realm of Britonia itself. As he searches, the knight strives to prove himself to the lady, performing good deeds, slaying foul beasts, entering into single combat with great and terrible foes, or through valor on the field of battle. Throughout all, the quest is always foremost in the knight's mind, daring to hope that one day his efforts will be rewarded with a sight of the grail. Few questing knights ever achieve this honor. Many are slain in combat with mighty and fearsome foes. Others live their whole lives without sight of the grail, their souls in constant yearning for it. A story of the Knights of Britonia. With a sword like rolling thunder, the knights pounded across the field. Great clods of muddy earth were thrown up in their wake, and the sky darkened as a cloud of arrows streaked overhead. 
and fell among the hated foe. At the forefront of the charge, Leon Hard felt the familiar surge of exhilaration as he rapidly closed the distance to the savage worshippers of the Chaos Gods. Picking his target, a giant of a man screaming incoherently, Leon Hard lowered his lance. The warrior tried to step to the side, but the veteran knight had anticipated such a move. His lance punched into the warrior's chest with the full weight of armored knight and horse behind it. Then lacquered wood ripped through the marauder's body. Screams and shouts erupted, mingling with sounds of crunching bone and clashing steel. As the other knights struck, horses' hooves flailed, caving in skulls and shattering bones and knights hacked deep into flesh with every strike of their blades. Leonhard dropped the butt of his splintered lance and drew his sword. He kicked one warrior in the face and sunk his blade into the neck of another who was trying to grab his steed's bridle. His bloody blade rose and fell, killing with every blow. He sensed the sudden hesitation amongst the foe, saw the doubt written on their faces. Cutting down another enemy, he suddenly found himself without an opponent. Rearing his steed up, he raised his voice above the din of battle. For Cunel, the king, and the lady. Grail Knights only when a questing knight has proved his valor and purity beyond all doubt does the Lady of the Lake appear to him in a vision, rewarding him not only with the sight of the grail, but also permitting him to drink from it. Few indeed are allowed to sup from this the holiest of Bretonian artifacts, and only those knights of unblemished purity survive a taste of the blessed waters from the chalice. Those who drink from the mystical chalice are changed forever, granted lifespans many times that of normal men, as well as other stranger gifts. From that moment on, the knight is irrevocably committed to the service of the lady and the grail, a bond that can only be broken by death. Each Grail Knight takes over the duties of guarding the holy places of the Lady. These are often simple places. An abandoned chapel, a lake or woodland grove, but are all sacred to the Grail Knights. Should a corrupted creature set foot within one of these places, they will face the awesome fury of its defender. For the Grail Knight will never flee from his defense of the Lady's land. A Grail Knight will only leave his sanctum in dire need, eschewing the luxuries of a noble life for a lifetime of service. Although some dukes will formally renounce their titles upon completing their quest to better protect the sacred places, many often decide that they can best guard these places by defending the whole land and so retain their title and other responsibilities. When such a knight journeys through a village or town, desperate crowds will surround him as the common people fight to touch the champion of the lady, and thus share in her blessing. Grail knights command respect and awe from all listeners, lowly peasants and mighty dukes alike. It is indeed a bold or foolhardy individual who will speak against a grail knight for their wrath is fearsome and terrible, and their words are those of the lady. Even within the most remote and isolated village in the realm, the people tell the tales of these paragons of earthly virtue, and of their glorious deeds in the lady's name. To the commoners of Bretonia, Grail Knights form a pantheon of living deities, their names spoken as a reverent mantra throughout the land, and are often worshipped in their own right. They are tireless, and know neither fear, hardship, nor despair. 
their words and deeds immortalized forever. Some five centuries since his death, many still recount how the eyes of Required of Brescard glowed with a terrible light as he slew the enemies of the lady, while others speak of the golden aura that protects all Grail Knights from harm. Amongst the most famous of all, Laudricus of Corone was believed to have been possessed of a heart so pure and noble that he was anathema to all unclean creatures and could slay them with the merest touch. Battle Pilgrims and the Grail Reliquary Wherever the Grail Knights travel, they gather a trail of fanatical worshippers whose only goal in life is to bask in the reflected glory of these mighty individuals. Driven by relentless obsession, these pilgrims collect almost anything that a Grail Knight casts away, whether it be scraps of ruined armor, clothing, or even discarded food. Such is their burning passion. These religious scavengers will follow their idol through all weathers and lands, exulting in his acts and praising his sparing words. The knights bear these followers with a dutiful resignation that borders on the Stoic, though they endeavor not to encourage their self-appointed apostles. This is a vain hope for even the merest word or gesture is seized upon as an act of great import and eagerly immortalized in tales and discordant song. If a Grail Knight is unfortunate enough to fall in battle, his devoted followers will swarm over his corpse, picking it clean of anything that could bear the blessing of the Lady. It has been known for these desperate peasants to mistake gravely wounded knights for dead, Indeed, it does not stretch credibility to believe that more than a few Grail Knights could well have met their demise as a result of being crushed by scavenging pilgrims. To such a zealot, the most prized of all the possessions of a Grail Knight is his body itself. In fact, many bands of pilgrims cart around a reliquary wherever they go, with the corpse of a departed knight resting at its center. The outside of the reliquary is a gaudy melange, adorned with trinkets gathered from many Grail Knights from across all corners of the realm. The pilgrims devote themselves to this construction, supplicating themselves before it as if it were a living Grail Knight, praying for its blessings. To the pilgrims, the reliquary is the ultimate icon of their devotion to both the Lady of the Lake and her knights. Mobile shrines from which the chosen amongst them can preach their creed. There is never a shortage of listeners for these demagogues, for at each town or village the common people will flock to the reliquary so that they might hear in graphic detail the latest tales and deeds of the heroic knight who unintentionally leads the procession. These gatherings can often turn ugly, the fanatical zealot of the pilgrims exploding into violence that the local militias can have difficulty containing. Such outbreaks are always short-lived, subsiding instantly at the command of a grail knight, the pilgrims collapsing into rapture at the thought of actually having been noticed by their idol. Often peasants in the crowd will choose to join the ragtag band of pilgrims drawn by promises of salvation and the blessing of the lady. Others are drafted into the ranks through threats and near blackmail, generously being offered an opportunity to earn the redemption of the lady for crimes and misdeeds that are sometimes real, but more usually invented by the fanatical preachers who are ever eager to expand their flock through any means. Men at Arms Each midsummer, commoners flock to their lord's castle to present their sons in the hope that they will be trained as men at arms. For a peasant to have a son accepted into the ranks of a knight's household is a great honor. Some young peasants will have been guided towards this goal through their entire life, encouraged to stand up straighter and taller than the usual peasant slouch 
to better improve their chances of selection. All morning and afternoon, the knight inspects the candidates. By dusk, the luckiest and strongest are selected and are taken back to the castle where they are given basic training and outfitted in the livery of their lord. The inductee is given an extravagant bounty for joining, though this all too often vanishes as the new recruits are expected to pay for their new uniform, equipment, and even make a contribution to the temples of Shalya. They are given room, a rough straw mattress in a barn, and board, thin gruel and stew, and earn a wage for their faithful service. On paper their wage is quite generous, far exceeding anything a peasant could otherwise legally earn, but what the militiamen actually receive is but a mere fraction of this total, if indeed they receive anything at all. Every conceivable expense is deducted from their salary, from their food and accommodation through to each and every equipment loss and breakage. Some miserly lords will even levy a charge for any funeral expenses incurred. While not terribly strong or skillful, men-at-arms provide the knight with a body of troops with which he can safeguard his domain. When the knight is summoned away to war, he will take many of these troops with him, but will always leave behind enough to safeguard his castle, and, if needs be, shelter the local villagers until he returns. In more peaceful times, the men-at-arms perform routine tasks, watching the borders of the domain and patrolling the knight's land. Peasant Bowman When the call to war comes, every peasant able to fight must serve in the armies of Bretonia. A willingness reinforced by the promised bounty of a copper coin for any who survive the campaign. A few are pressed into service alongside the standing companies of men-at-arms, bulking out ranks thinned by casualties or sickness. However, most are employed as levies of longbowmen who are expected to engage enemies unworthy of a knight's attention. Though the tenants of the chivalric honor forbid a knight to use any kind of missile weapon, there is of course no such restriction on the peasants who are not expected to know better. Though the wage of a peasant archer could be judged pitiful by most standards, to the commoners of Bretonia it is a princely wage indeed. Most parents will encourage their offspring to practice with a bow so they might increase the family's earnings. Unlike men-at-arms, peasant bowmen are not equipped from the armories of the castle and turn up to battle in all manner of garb. Likewise, their longbows will often be their own possessions, handed down from father to son, though it is a rich family that can afford more than a single bow, and accordingly can be of variable quality. To make their numbers count, these longbowmen congregate into huddled units on the battlefield, directing volley after volley into the enemy. Like men-at-arms, peasant bowmen are not very reliable if left to their own devices, but under the stern gaze of a knight, can aspire to adequate, though not exceptional, deeds. Mounted Yeomen As they hold such privileged positions as head jailers and militia sergeants, to become a yeoman is the highest rank to which a peasant can aspire. It takes many years of dedicated service for a man-at-arms to be so promoted, and even then only an act of bravery on the battlefield will guarantee his ascension. Though no peasant may ride the steeds of the Bretonian lords, favored yeomen are permitted to ride to battle on draft horses. Such troops will often scout ahead of the main army and keep the knights informed of enemy movements. A dangerous task, and one which earns no honor, so it is a task that the nobility believe is best performed by peasants. All men-at-arms dream of one day becoming a yeoman possibly because of the folk stories that tell of yeomen being raised to knighthood after performing a great service, or some brave deed. The truth is that it is almost unheard of for a peasant to be elevated in this way, 
the nobility have no wish to sully their ranks with low-born commoners. Pegasus Knights Most Pegasus Knights hail from around the border city of Paravan. Hard on the slopes of the Grey Mountains where many of their noble mounts can be found. Their numbers are made up almost exclusively of Knights of the Realm, and then only the richest and most influential knights can boast of owning a battle-trained Pegasus. For the creatures are difficult to capture, and harder still to train. Accordingly, to own such a beast is the ultimate symbol of wealth and success for their owners. But in truth, a Pegasus is also a great practical boon for any knight fortunate enough to acquire one. A Pegasus is stronger and faster than even the mightiest warhorse, easily able to crush a man's skull with its flailing hooves and cover great distances swiftly. Indeed, in the more wild and inaccessible domains of Bretonia, there is real merit to a steed that is not prone to becoming mired in mud or entangled in thorns. On the battlefield, small groups of Pegasus knights will group together, often outstripping the rest of the army as they search for honorable combat. Royal Pegasus The purest of all Pegasus, legend has it that these creatures are descended from Glorfiniel himself, the steed of Agilgar, first Duke of Paravent and Grail companion of Gilles Le Breton. Noble and proud, these creatures are amongst the most intelligent of beasts, often displaying exceptional loyalty for their masters. Most famous of all was the steed of Fanverlain the Flamboyant, which loyally tried to defend his severely wounded master from an angry dragon. Though the dragon was at first unperturbed as the Pegasus gamely attacked it with flailing hooves, the giant beast lost all interest in Fanderlin after it had suffered several wounds. It turned its attention to the Pegasus, thus saving the wounded knight. Bretonian folklore is filled with many other such tales, and it is said that only death will separate a royal Pegasus and his master. Only the richest and most powerful nobles own a royal Pegasus, for they are incredibly rare. Those fortunate enough to own one treat it with the greatest respect, almost as if it were their peer. Each lord will have a handful of knights errant in his retinue whose responsibility it is to care for this. His prized possession, and noblest of steeds. Peasants are never allowed near these beasts lest their stench or clumsiness cause the Pegasus harm. Indeed, tales tell of the obsessive Volstal of Cunel who executed any peasant that even gazed upon his steed. Hippogriffs Ferocious and wild, hippogriffs inhabit the upper reaches of the Grey Mountains, occasionally prowling the green lands below for stray sheep and cattle. They are fierce beasts and will fight to the death against any creature that strays into their territory, whether it be a lost peasant or roaming dragon. Only the most committed of men can ride one of these beasts, for hippogriffs are strong-willed and ill-tempered, more than willing to fling their rider from his saddle should he prove lax upon the reins. Taming a hippogriff presents a challenge that many Bretonian lords cannot turn down, and this has made them into much sought-after steeds. To successfully train a hippogriff, the animal must be captured and broken at a very young age. But given the relentless territorialism of adult hippogriffs, acquiring a chick or an egg can prove to be a very dangerous proposition indeed. Occasionally, the task of approaching such a beast is given to a knight errant as a way of proving himself. More often, a duke will find suitable volunteers from the peasantry, promising a huge reward to any survivors that return with a healthy, young hippogriff. Bretonian War Horses The Bretoni have always been renowned horsemen, 
and in turn their war horses are still believed to be the best in the old world. Some old tales recount how the original bloodline had been strengthened with that of the northern war horses, breeding in their endurance and fiery temper. Others impart that the essence of fey steeds pulses strong, deep within the inheritance of the modern-day war horses. Whatever the cause, it is true that the Bretonian knights owe their success not only to their own valor and skill, but also to the endurance and temper of their steeds. So highly valued are these beasts that a royal decree of many centuries standing forbids the export of these magnificent animals. Naturally, only a noble is permitted to ride a war horse, though a few lucky and trusted peasants may be allowed to act as grooms and stable hands, and thus sleep in the same barn as one. Field Trebuchets Trebuchets are immense wooden structured war machines recently introduced into the armies of the Bretonians. Through a series of levers, cogs, and winding mechanisms, the large arm of the trebuchet is drawn down into a firing position, with immense masonry counterweights attached to the other end. A large sling is attached to the arm of the trebuchet that can hold rocks, masonry, or even dead cattle. When the trebuchet is fired, the extra impetus that the sling adds to the firing arm means that it can fire further and with more power than a regular catapult. The trebuchet is an essential piece of equipment when the Bretonians engage in siege warfare, and smaller versions of these machines are sometimes deployed on the field of battle. Indeed, since the king himself commissioned a number of trebuchets to be built to act in the defense of Coron, their popularity has increased. Still, most knights universally put on a show of disdain towards them, and some dukes refuse to make use of them at all. Nevertheless, it is a sign of a particular opulence to be in possession of a trebuchet, for they are time-consuming to create, and are individually hand-crafted. There are only a finite number of craftsmen within Bretonia with the skill to create them, and their services are heavily sought after. Although a knight would never stoop so low as to operate a missile weapon himself, let alone a war machine, that is not to say that he could not grudgingly see the strategic worth of it and allow his low-born servants to use them. For being peasants, they don't understand the concept of honor anyway. The first Bretonian trebuchet is believed to have been constructed in the small village of Dessin, on the north coast of Lyonnais. It is said that an eccentric bastard child, a pious young man prone to fits and visions, built the war machine in a single night of feverish activity, using parts of the crumbling grail chapel of Adelhard II, as well as pieces scrounged from various other sources. When the village was attacked by northern raiders, it was this construction that fended them off, firing massive chunks of masonry to sink the marauders' longships. The young man was later presented to the king, and his designs copied and improved upon. For saving the village and maintaining the purity of the Grail Chapel, though it was now even more ruinous than before, the young man was gifted with a fatted pig and two copper crowns, more wealth than he could have hoped to see in a lifetime. The Green Knight The Green Knight is a well-known figure of Bretonian folklore, and stories and poems about him are amongst the most popular in Bretonia. A common character in puppet shows and plays performed for peasants and kings alike, he is bedecked in strange ivy-covered armor and intones his famous line, None shall pass. The traditional nemesis of the valiant questing knights of these tales, the Green Knight challenges them to duels so that they might prove their worth to the lady herself, and thus sup from the Blessed Grail. Little do most realize that these stories are bound in fact. The Green Knight is the sacred protector of Bretonia, 
and his spirit essence is intertwined with the land and the Lady of the Lake herself. He has appeared to many questing knights. They speak of the sky clouding over to create the darkness of twilight, and a green mist seeping from the earth, slowly taking the shape of a figure riding a snorting steed. The warrior brandishes a glowing blade, his eyes ablaze with fey light. The Green Knight is the champion of the Lady of the Lake and protector of the sacred sites of Bretonia. As well as materializing to test questing knights in their faith, the Green Knight will appear when these sacred places are defiled by those with evil-hearted intent. Among the beast herds of the tainted forests, he is known as Shab Hek, literally the soul killer, for he has slain untold thousands of their kind throughout the centuries. He bursts from within the bowl of the most ancient trees, or gallops furiously from still lakes or rushing waterfalls, to wreak his terrible vengeance against these interlopers. As quickly as he appears, so too will he fade into mist once his righteous slaughter is complete. In some tales, he will disappear in one place only to reappear behind the enemy, slaying them without mercy before again disappearing, and reappearing elsewhere. Weapons have little effect on the Green Knight. Some say that blades and arrows pass straight through him as though he were as insubstantial as morning mist. While in other stories, even the most grievous of wounds inflicted upon him have virtually no effect. In one epic tale, a questing knight cut to the green knight's head clean from his shoulders. But the fey being simply picked up his head and rode away. What the Green Knight actually is has been much debated, and no one in Bretonia, save perhaps the Fey Enchantress, knows the truth. Some believe that he is the spirit of Bretonia given physical form, while others say that he is Gilles Le Breton himself, having devoted himself completely to the land and the lady after he was taken from this world. The Fey Enchantress. A figure of awe and inspiration, the Fey Enchantress is the personal representative of the Lady of the Lake, and as such is the most influential figure in all of Bretonia. Her will is that of the goddess, and even kings of Bretonia must bow to her wise counsel. The Grail Knights, having sworn their lives completely to the goddess, are bound by their sacred oaths to respond to any call or decree of the Fey Enchantress. Their vows ensure that their duty is paramount, coming even before loyalties to Duke and King. For the Fey Enchantress and the Lady represent the land of Bretonia more so than any mortal lord ever could. At times when the king has no clear heir, the Fey Enchantress alone has the power to instate a worthy replacement. Evidence of the Fey Enchantress's power over the realms can most forcefully be seen during the time of King Baoyum the Brave, when she ordered the Grail Knights of the king's own court to forcefully expel him, stripping him of his title and honor before banishing him from the realm and installing his successor. It is believed that through the centuries there have been many enchantresses, and she has certainly gone by many different names. The current Fey Enchantress is known as Morgiana. Some believe that the Fey Enchantress has lived through all the ages of Bretonia, making her thousands of years old. Others speculate that when each Fey Enchantress passes from the world, she is instantly reincarnated so that she can continue her sacred duty. Existing outside the usual hierarchy of power within Bretonia, the Fey Enchantress comes and goes as she pleases, guided by the will of the Lady of the Lake. It has also been known for her to appear to questing knights, 
guiding them on their final journey to the lady. As she travels the lands, slipping mysteriously between the sacred groves, she gathers to her side young children, children that have intense latent power within them, that is hidden to all but herself. These chosen youngsters are taken by the Fey Enchantress to a place beyond time and mortality, to the mysterious other world. The girl children occasionally return years later as damsels of the lady, blessed in spirit and heart. Of the male children, nothing is ever heard again. On occasions of particular peril, the Fey Enchantress will rouse the dukes, or even the king himself, and ready them for war. She will sometimes ride alongside these armies, lending her unearthly powers towards the protection of those fighting in the name of the Lady. Her legendary fury is greatly feared, and her piercing eyes crackle with power, inspiring terror and awe in friend and foe alike. She has been known to draw lightning from the sky to strike her enemies and slay with but a wrathful glance. The Fey Enchantress rides into battle on Silveron, a proud and noble unicorn, a beast that is said to dwell within the mysterious other world of Bretonian lore. It is said that only the capricious spirit beings that dwell there can ride these creatures, and that the Fey Enchantress can do so makes many believe that she is not mortal at all. King Luan Leoncur. Luan Leoncur is the greatest leader of the Bretonians since Gilles the Uniter. A mighty warrior king, his subjects know well that he is the pinnacle of knightly perfection and honor. Highly skilled on the field of battle and a master of tactics and strategy, he has never known defeat. Commoners and nobles alike speak of Leoncur with the same reverence, likening him to the mighty companions of Gilles from the ages past. Some say that the blood of Gilles runs in his veins. As ferocious yet honorable in diplomacy as he is in war, King Lewin the Lionhearted is renowned far beyond the borders of Bretonia itself and respected by all. Since his coronation in 2500, Lewin has proved himself time and time again. He utterly crushed the massive orc invasion of 2508 at the Battle of Swamphold, and has ridden battlefields clear of the undead on the outskirts of Moussoulin on more than one occasion. He has fought victoriously against invaders of the north, driving them back into the sea and scoured the taint of insidious covens from within his cities. Leoncourt has always attacked the enemies of Bretonia with fiery wrath and determination, yet never have his actions been anything other than chivalrous and honorable. Although such rigid adherence to the codes of martial honor could be seen to hinder a more unscrupulous general, it is a great source of strength for King Lewin. He is blessed above all other mortals by the Lady of the Lake, and some whisper he has even been granted a kiss by his goddess. It is certain that the magical power of the Grail flows in his veins. Legend has it that where Leoncourt is cut, light streams out from the wound until it is healed over once more. After more than twenty glorious years on the throne, Lewin still appears to be in the prime of his life, though scholars whisper that he is close to his ninetieth year. It is said that he intends to turn his attention to cursed Musalon, cleansing it of taint and restoring it to its former glory. If he does this, the lands of Bretonia will be united under his banner once and for all. <laughs>